G'day, welcome back to Bootlosophy, and if we haven't met, my name is Tech. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land uh, that I live and work on, the Wajuk people of this Noongar country. Today, I'm taking a look at the Nix oh, Robert boot. This is their casual boot with the genesis of their work boot experience and expertise and incorporating a high dogger heel. So this is the Robert boot made by Nix from the US Pacific Northwest tradition. As you can see, uh, although it's marketed as a tough casual boot, this definitely has work boot genes. Nix Handmade Boots is famous for making boots uh, for loggers and firefighters in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. So you can see that when they make a casual boot, it's still as tough as all their work boots. This is a plain toe boot with a shaft that's about 6 inches high from the top of the heel. However, it looks taller because it incorporates this 2 inch dogger heel, uh, which I'll talk about later. I'm not an expert on these um, higher heeled boots, and so I'm not really sure what the differences are between a dogger heel, which I'm told this is, a logger heel, and a cowboy heel. Um, aesthetically, I can see that this dogger heel looks similar to the heel on my western cowboy boots in that it has a slanted angle at the back. I can also see from the web that what people call a logger heel has a curved back to it. That's about all I know about these heels. Later on when I talk about the construction though, I'll discuss the need for a higher heel in these boots uh, because of the arch support that's built into them. Let's talk about how you would pair these boots with outfits. Look, I have to admit, these things look like outdoorsy woodsman you know, logger work boots, at least in the American work boot tradition. This is even though Nix themselves described the Robert boot as originally made for serious workers wanting a weekend boot. At the same time in making this boot, they differentiated it from their falcon boot by giving it greater arch support and a higher heel, making it consistent with the other serious work boot models. On top of that, they construct it with this thick Wicket & Craig uh, veg tan bridal leather. Bridal as in horse tack, not bride at a wedding. Now that's a thought. Anyway, you surely can't go wrong wearing these boots with basically work gear. For example, they seriously go well with a pair of denim jeans and some sort of work shirt or flannel shirt uh, and, and, and a work or leather style jacket. I think they also work with things like canvas pants, um, uh, uh, canvas shirts and maybe other bomber jacket type things. I have tried them with chinos, but I think you have to be careful that in that case, uh, you dress to look just neat rather than dressy casual. Th these are not dressy at all. Although they were designed as weekend boots for manual workers, I don't think they extend to anything in, in, towards that dressy end of casual. So before we go on, let's take a look at the history of Nix boots. I think in order to understand where Nix boots come from for non-Americans, we have to see what a holy grail of a center for quality boot making the American Pacific Northwest Coast means to Americans. Where once upon a time heritage boot making was available right across the United States, uh, globalism and the world economy, as well as I, I, I think it's fair to say our 21st century throwaway culture, that's meant that the uh, American heritage boot making business has declined. However, the Pacific Northwest states, primarily Oregon uh, and Washington state, still remain a critical center of quality boot makers as represented by Whites, Nicks, Franks, Wesco, JKs, uh, and if my American viewers don't mind, including their uh, Canadian cousins, Viberg. Within this epicenter of boot history, Nick's handmade boots were started in 1964 by Nick Blahutsin, I hope I'm saying that right, in Spokane, Washington. The original Nick has an interesting history being born in the Ukraine of Russian descent. He was still in the Ukraine when Germany invaded the USSR in 1941 and he was conscripted into the Soviet army during World War II. 
After the war, he immigrated to the US in the 1950s and eventually settled in Washington state. He worked for White's Boots for a while until he started his own business in 1964. The original Nick finally retired in 1986 after the business had been uh, bought over by Gary Myers and Leonard Smith. Throughout that period, uh, Nick's was gaining a quality reputation, particularly uh, for forest firefighters from all over the US, Canada and even Mexico. The uh, business has changed hands a few times since then, but it has grown from strength to strength as a quality maker of work boots for loggers, packers, and woodland firefighters. They have since increased their product range to include work boots for builders and other trades, or at least in America, uh, as well as their more casual boots such as this Robert boot. Clearly some of these names that I've mentioned like loggers and packers are foreign to people not in the US, but you can guess how steeply entwined Nick's boots is to the US logging industry. Now let's turn to how these boots are constructed. Starting at the bottom, the outsole is a rubber Vibram 430-430 outsole with mini commando lugs. This provides a reasonable grip on most surfaces while still uh, looking reasonably flat in profile. The heel, as I said, is built up to two inches using stacks on stacks of veg tan leather uh, topped by a thick Vibram uh, rubber top lift. You'll notice this bow at the arch here. Keep that in mind. I'll talk about what happens there when I go inside the boot and talk about arch support. Moving on up comes a leather midsole which is over five millimeters thick. Combined with the rubber outsole you have you know near over one centimeter of sole construction that's under your feet and that's even before we talk about the insole. The uppers of this boot are connected to the sole layers using a double row stitch down method. This is where the front part of the uppers are flanged out and then stitched down through the midsole and the outsole. The back half of the uppers are turned in and then stitched and nailed to the layers in the insole. If you look inside, the bottoms are made up of layers of leather and then more leather. <laughs> Forget about foam or poron, there ain't nothing to see here. Uh, now we come to the arch support. Forget about a thin steel shank. The arch support in the Robert boot is made up of layers of shaped leather creating the contours for this arch uh, as well as forming the shank. The layers of leather are built up at the bottom in such a way uh, as to create this bow here uh, in the arch area of the outsole. And this is where the high dogger heel comes in. The high heel accommodates a high arch support coming from the layers of leather in the arch. If a block heel was used, all that leather that creates a hump under your arch becomes quite annoying, but on the slope caused by the higher heel, they form a shape to comfortably support your arch on the inside. Now moving on up, the upper's leather is from Wicket and Craig. It's the vegetable tanned English bridal leather. It's up to three millimeters thick in some places certainly one of the thickest leather in any of my boots, uh, comparable to the Chrome Excel on my White's MP boots and the, uh, the Colata in my Viberg service boots. As a tannery, Wicket and Craig have been tanning leather since 1867. They're said to be one of the uh, just two remaining uh, vegetable tanneries in the US. The leathers that they're famous for tanning include oil litigo and this English bridal leather. This is vegetable tanned, as I said, uh, and used in equestrian gear as well as other high-end leather goods. It is uh, drum dyed and hot stuffed with waxes, revealing a smooth full grain surface. I found this leather to be extremely supple and flexible and yet tough, and certainly uh, it doesn't mark very easily. Okay, I haven't built a house wearing this, nor have I done anything particularly spectacular outdoors, but you can tell when the leather is resilient. The stitching on the uppers is pretty good for a work boot manufacturer. Don't expect to find stitching like in dress shoes, but there's nothing really wrong with this. Uh, this is made by work boot makers, definitely. The double row uh, stitch down stitching is neater than on my White's MP boots, and the stitch per inch density is actually quite uniform. Really not bad for being hand stitched. Elsewhere, it's triple and quadruple stitch where it counts at the quarters and the uh, heel counter covers. 
There is a two-piece heel stay made up of a well-stitched back strip and the counter cover. The collar of the shaft is rolled and securely stitched, but the lace edgings are raw though. The toe box is a uh, lightly structured toe box, stiffened with, um, I think, leather. It's quite uh, uh, giving. The external heel counter is all leather. The whole boot is unlined, uh, unnecessary to line it really when you consider the thickness of the leather and its suppleness. The tongue is made of a softer, thinner, dark brown leather. It looks and kind of feels like chrome excel, but I don't think it is. Uh, the tongue is fully gusseted, bellows tongue that you have to fold when you lace your boots. A kilty is provided and it's made of the same thick English bridle leather. This boot has eight brass eyelets, no speed hooks. I understand though uh, that if you wanted speed hooks, they could be put on on a, on a custom fit. The construction is really solid. You can feel the layers and layers of leather when you slip your foot in and you can feel the support of the arch as well as the uh, uh, leather heel counter as you lift the boot in your hand, it's heavy. <laughs> this is built on Nick's 55 last, uh, which is a high arch last. The 55 has a reasonably round toe and good support around the ball of the foot, the waist, as well as the heel. The aesthetic is not for everyone, I think, but it has a certain appeal to me. I guess in terms of aesthetic, the only thing that I'm undecided about is this high heel, something that I'm just not used to. Now, looking at leather care, while Wicket and Craig don't provide any information, it is a waxy smooth leather, and I think conditioning with any oil or wax-based conditioner would be fine. Nicks include a small jar of grease with the boots, which I think is actually Obanoff's. I have conditioned these with that. It hasn't really darkened the leather, and it feels really fine. You can, I think, also condition it with, uh, say, Neat's Foot Oil or Mink Oil, although I'd be careful about the mink oil, which I have found as dark and leather. This leather is pretty durable and from my experience, decently waterproof. So from time to time, washing it down with saddle soap or even just plain water, I don't think will harm it. As usual though, the most important care is to keep it clean and dust free by brushing it with a good quality horsehair brush as regularly as you can. Dust and grit is leather's worst enemy. I bought these from eBay in good condition in a size 8D, uh, that's a US size 8D. My US Brannock size is 8.5 in D width, so I size down by a half and it really fits well. Now I know that you can order these for a special fit, but I assume the original owner of these uh, bought these as a standard fit. Assuming that's true, in this standard fit, I'd recommend going down a half size from your Brannock. When I got these, I could see that they were only lightly worn. I mean, look at the heel. Uh, there was zero wear. Uh, look at the sole. And the uh, stitching at the bottom of the outsole is barely touched. The leather at the vamp was only lightly creased. So even though these were very lightly used, I didn't find that I needed to break these boots in. Maybe the few wears by the original owner had already broken them in, but my feeling is that they don't actually require a lot of breaking if you get the right size. So in terms of comfort, uh, the fit around my foot, heel and ankle is a really good fit and extremely comfortable. As for the arch support, when I fir first put these on in the morning, I really feel that lump digging into my slightly fallen arches. However, within 20 or 30 minutes, whether it's my feet adapting to the boot or uh, whether it's the way the arch support has been molded in leather, they really start to feel good. By the end of the day, I'd have forgotten about the lumps under my arches and I do really feel supported and comfortable. I know that the high heel adds to the effect, but nevertheless, that's the one thing about these boots that I'm not particularly fond of and I, I do feel like I'm standing in high heels. Now, how about value? So as I said, I bought these on eBay for Australian $300. Given the very light wear, I think that was a steal. On their website, the standard Robert model sells for US $569. I believe depending on options, they can go up to $600, 600 plus US. So bear in mind, you can't compare these to mid-range boots uh, in terms of material and quality of construction. So don't even try to attempt to compare them to say Red Wing or anything similar. 
I think for a true comparison, you do have to look at the other Pacific Northwest brands. At the high 500s, they're in the same ballpark as boots from White's and even some Vibo models. Other brands like Frank's and JK also have their boots around this range. Vyberg's service boots sell for $700 and above, but I think they market their service boots as dressier, tough boots rather than rough work boots. And you can tell that from their finishing. I think as value, they compare really well with their competitors, taking into account the materials that NYX uses, uh, the amount of leather that's in these boots, and the quality control that I can see. Would I buy them new? Ooh, that, that's a tough one. I don't really have a need for boots built this well. My grail boot was the White's MP boot, and I wanted that not for its construction, but simply because it is a grail. I have a pair of Vibok service boots, again, not bought to be used as a work boot, but because I want that dressy quality. As for this Robert boot, I don't wear it that frequently because I, I just don't need a boot built this well as a casual, let's face it, work boot, as opposed to a smart casual service boot. So the answer is no, I would not buy new because I would not use it for what it's intended to be used for. However, having bought it for 300 Aussie dollars, I'm glad I've got this at that price. Let's get that clear. My hesitation is not about the value to price ratio, but the fact that I just wouldn't use it. So let's summarize. These are one pair of tough boots. The leather used is remarkable in my opinion, the weighty construction, the layer on layer of leather, the hand stitch construction all add to a very pleasurable boot to wear. On the other hand, despite Nick saying that these boots were for weekend wear, meaning casual wear and not work wear, they're not something that I would wear on many casual occasions, at least not in Australia. Quite frankly, they're overbuilt for me and their design aesthetic as a Pacific Northwest forestry boot just doesn't use, uh, suit my use cases in Australia. Your experience, particularly if you're American, might be totally different. Having said all of that, I'm not, a, not at all sorry that I've got this. Uh, they are something to admire. So that's it. I hope you liked the review. You know what to do if you did. Click on the like button below and if you haven't already, please click on the subscribe button to help me to grow my channel and to notify you of the other boot reviews uh, boot cleaning videos and boot brand comparison videos that I have coming up. Until the next time, please take care and I'll see you soon.